The Hereford Mapa Mundi is one of the great medieval treasures of the world. Created on a single piece of vellum around the year 1300, it opens a unique window into the medieval mind. Sarah Arrowsmith, Head of Schools and Family Learning at Hereford Cathedral, tells the fascinating story of the Mapa Mundi. The Hereford Mapa Mundi is the largest surviving Mapa Mundi from the Middle Ages. It's not quite unique because there are plenty of other little diagrams of the world from the medieval time, but our Mapa Mundi is the largest surviving complete map on parchment. It measures about five foot by four foot, and it's a sort of pentagonal shape, a bit like the gable end of a house. For the people of the Middle Ages coming to see the map, this would have been a stunning display of the collected knowledge of mankind from the beginning of history, from the Garden of Eden to the end of the world in the Day of Judgment, depicted by Christ sitting, judging the world at the apex of the map. At first sight, the continents and the countries and the rivers and seas look peculiarly distorted, but in fact, the world's not quite as distorted as it may at first seem. The way I like to imagine it is if you take a globe off its stand and twist it around until Jerusalem is actually facing up at you in the centre of what you're looking at, and then twist that around until the British Isles are to your left-hand side, and then if you look down on that from above, that's roughly the sort of image you have on our Mapa Mundi, with east at the top, west at the bottom, north to your left-hand side and south to your right-hand side. Jerusalem is at the centre of the map. And above Jerusalem is the crucifixion. And this is a really significant statement. Jerusalem, for the people of the Middle Ages, was not just the centre of the world. It was also a figurative centre. It was the centre of life and the destination of humanity. The end of the world, the apocalypse, were particularly important. Around Jerusalem are drawings of numerous cities, citadels, cathedrals, little creatures, animals, and strange and wondrous beasts and wonderful, peculiar humanoid creatures. The map itself is based on a sort of diagram of the world that appears in many medieval manuscripts. So there's a circle and across the circle, a line which is like the um, diameter of the circle and this bottom part is divided into two quarters. So you've got a T in the centre of a circle. The top part of the T is Asia, the continent of Asia. The bottom left hand is the continent of Europe and the bottom right hand is the continent of Africa, the three continents that made up the world for Christendom in the Middle Ages. The world's ocean surrounds the terrestrial landmass. It's full of islands, the largest of which, by a very long way, are the British Isles. They're strangely distorted and very squashed, but they're incredibly big compared to the rest of the world. The British Isles includes a number of cities. London is very big. York is very big. Lincoln is significantly large. And you can see the little houses going up the hill. You can see the building at the top of the hill. And this is one of the reasons that many people believe the map may have been made in Lincoln or at least copied from an exemplar that had been made by someone who knew Lincoln. 
Hereford itself on the map is very small and very indistinct. According to Malcolm Parks, who's examined the handwriting of the map, the whole entry for Hereford was actually added after the map had been made, but by the same scribe. And in order to add it, he had to scrub out what had originally been the wording for the River Severn. So he rubbed it out with his penknife and then wrote in the words for Hereford and the River Wye. Hereford itself now is also very faint and rubbed out. Pilgrims, over the many centuries the map has been displayed, have been pointing to Hereford with their fingers and saying, look, there we are, there's Hereford. I think all those little bits of information make the map seem quite human in a way. First of all, the parchment would have had to be made and for the purpose of our map, a calf was probably born and bred specifically for the purpose. We know this because the parchment's a pretty good quality. There's actually in one place you can see a little tick mark where the poor little calf was got at by a tick. The first thing to do would be for the first artist to draw the circles that made up the world and Jerusalem, which would set the design for the whole thing. After the circles have been put in, then the outlines of the seas and the rivers, and then the animals were drawn in first, and then the cities. After all the images were in, then a scribe would have had to come along and write in the texts, and that would have been a phenomenally difficult job. Some of the texts are at right angles, some are diagonal, and of course he had to fit in the words into the spaces between the pictures. Because of the size of the whole thing, this would have been incredibly difficult. This was clearly a very skilled job. In one or two places you can see where he hadn't quite got the letters right to fit into the end of the space that was allocated. But generally, if you look at it, the craftsmanship is quite immense. After the scribe had finished, then a limner, an illuminator, would have come in and put in the illuminated letters, the gold letters for the continents and for the letters denoting Morse, death, around the outside of the world. Once finished, the map would have been vibrant with colour. It had been drawn onto the flesh side of the parchment, which would have had a sort of silky sheen to it. So underlying the map was a wonderfully creamy white colour on which the reds and the greens and blues and golds would have really stood out. The map would have looked truly stunning in those days. So you can imagine that someone coming into the cathedral and seeing a piece, just looking at them like this with God's world drawn onto it, would have found it an amazing experience. This for them was the creation, the story of humanity from its beginning to its end. The worldly time, the mundane map, is anchored down by four letters, M-O-R-S, Moors spelling death in Latin. And around the outside of the world, there are images that depict the cosmological nature of time. So it's not just a geographical map, it's also a map that looks at time as well as space. At the very top of the map, at the apex, Christ sits enthroned. He's displaying the wounds of the crucifixion on his hands and on his feet and in his side. Around him, there's a rainbow. At his feet, the Virgin Mary is interceding for mankind at the Day of Judgment. On Christ's right, a very orderly queue of the risen and the redeemed rise out of their coffins. They're led by what appears to be a bishop by his mitre, followed by a king, and that may be a political statement, who knows, the bishop first and the king second, and they're led towards the gates of heaven by an angel. The gates of heaven are flung wide open and the angel is leading them in. You are welcome, the angel says. 
On the other side, on Christ's left hand, the gates of heaven are firmly closed. There is no entry there. And an angel on that side is holding his hand up as if repelling the people and the poor folks in the queue on this side have been stripped of all their worldly possessions. They're unclothed, in fact, and they're tied together and led by a demon towards the mouth of hell. The mouth of hell is depicted as the large mouth of a dragon-like beast. And this sort of image is very typical of the sort of doomsday image that you would get in a chancel arch. Next to Christ also are angels bearing the instruments of the passion. So this is a scene of judgments and it's a scene reminding us of crucifixion as well. Immediately below the Virgin in the world we have a circular island, another circular feature on the map. And this island is the earthly paradise. Inside the island there are four rivers and the tree out of which a serpent is coiling itself and heading towards Eve. The terrestrial paradise, although it's in the world, is totally split from the whole of the inhabited land mass. It's surrounded by a battlemented wall, a ring of fire and water, and its gates are firmly shut. And beneath that, an angel is banishing Adam and Eve from paradise. The figures are bent over, they're cowed with the shame of their sin, which would condemn the whole of mankind to a life of sin before their final reconciliation at the Day of Judgment. And this is largely what the whole map is talking about, the worldly aspects of life, often depicted in the moralities displayed by the animals and by the strange creatures around the side of the map, but also we're looking to salvation as well. So it's a spatial, temporal and spiritual map in that sense. At the bottom of the map, a figure on horseback rides away. He's looking back at the world and there's some writing in Anglo-Norman at the bottom of the map saying, pas avant, go beyond, as if to encourage the figure on horseback to leave this world, to go beyond the worldly realm. And at the back of his horse, there is an orb surmounted by a cross. It's got golden decorations on it. When you look at the map today, you can't actually see the gold, but if you bring it up on a computer, you can see that there are still flecks of really what looks like gold paint on his saddle and on some of the decorations. So it's a highly decorated horse. It's obviously for a very significant purpose. The chap is riding the horse. We don't know who he is, but maybe he's symbolic of every man. He's looking back at the world and raising his arm. The labels for Europe and Africa have been transposed. Where Europe is, it says Africa, and where Africa is, it says Europe. In the Middle Ages, there was a lot of interest in a science called perspectiva and the science of optics. This was used as an allegory for spiritual vision. The letter of St Paul to the Corinthians with that very famous quote, now we see through a glass darkly, was interpreted as meaning that in this world we see only the reflection of God, but in the next we'll see clearly. And I wonder if the little man on his horse is looking back at that transposed lettering. The words are meant to be the wrong way round and it's highlighted that they're the wrong way round because they're in gold lettering. And to my mind, he's looking back and from his vantage of being on the verge of his spiritual reconciliation, he's now seeing the world as it truly is from the divine perspective. For Hereford Cathedral today, Mapamundi is an amazing piece of unique medieval history and we're very, very proud to have it. We prize it immensely. You can see the Mapamundi at Hereford Cathedral. To learn more, visit their website at www.herefordcathedral.org. 
You can also read a fascinating new article by Sarah Arrowsmith and watch the companion programme, Mapa Mundi Into the Medieval Mind, at the History West Midlands website, www.historywm.com. <laughs>